University of Sheffield where I'm a lecturer in Biblical and Religious Studies. And my research is in early Christianity and early Judaism and specifically how food works as symbols in those communities. I'm looking at this really weird passage in John 6 where Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're not getting into the kingdom of heaven. And so I look at that passage um, apart from any Eucharistic overtones that it might have, because I think um, if we solely look at it in, in terms of the Eucharist, we're kind of missing what's going on there. So instead, I'm looking at it in terms of its um, cannibalistic language and what goes on with the sacrificial language that's used by Jesus in that um, in that phrase. So I compare um, other instances in Greco-Roman literature of human sacrifice and of cannibalistic languages, specifically in the ancient romance novels where similarly the protagonists are likened to divine beings and also sacrificed and consumed by well, usually wrong religious practitioners, it's not usually upheld as something. But so that inversion of the same motifs is something that I think is going on in John, that John is playing with that notion. So in the end, what that means is that Jesus saying those um, sacrificial sounding words, that is the moment where Jesus and God become identified. So it's really an identification of, um, of Jesus and, and God at that moment. It's fascinating to me that it does something so different with the meals compared with the synoptics. And whether that's because it's a conscious um, removing of itself from that kind of context and practice or whether it just didn't know about them. Um, I just find that really interesting that, you know, the Last Supper in, in John is more about foot washing than eating. And on the other hand, we have this weird eating scene in, in John 6 that does something uh, completely different. The consensus kind of goes back and forth depending on the decade. So some people were like, this is definitely the Eucharist and it's just weird and that's fine. And other people argued, well, actually there's no sacraments anywhere in John. There's not even a baptism. So why would he include the Eucharist here when there's nothing else like that? Um, I, well, I like to think of myself as not particularly on an either or kind of camp, but more like John is concerned with different things than um, Christian early Christian ritual practice. Um, I think I think it's a Christological gospel. I think it really is trying to talk about Jesus' identity. There's a lot of um, places in the text where um, Jesus' identity is is really the focal point more so than followers' behavior. Um, and so I think looking at John 6 from that perspective can give us a different understanding of what the text is actually doing. Eating is such a fundamental part of being a human and it seems like um, in most if not all cultures there's, there's symbolism attached to food and we imbue it with such meaning because it's so attached to, to our humanity and how we envision our humanity. So whether you're eating the right thing or the wrong thing, um, we would never eat that kind of thing but we only eat this thing on special occasions. I think there's something that's so connected with the construction of identity, either group identity or individual identity when you eat something. Um, and so that's really something that I think um, is a great window into the ancient world. My next book is called Hierophagy, Transformational Eating in Ancient Literature. And this is where I'm defining a literary trope that I've identified in six, well, I'm looking at six texts specifically. There's, there's many more that I'm not gonna have time to touch. Um, but I've identified a basic pattern of um, access to the divine realm through eating heavenly food. So there's six texts that, that do this that I'm looking at, two pagan, two Jewish, and two Christian. Um, so Revelation is, is the one um, from the New Testament with the little scroll. So the seer consumes the scroll and is able to have access to divine knowledge where no one else is able to have that, that access. So there's a ton of other um, texts that do that. The best example from contemporary times, if it's more accessible to everyone, is um, Alice in Wonderland. So she you know, gets down into this liminal space, but it's not Wonderland. 
she's only able to access Wonderland after she's had the eat me cake and the drink me drink, and then she's able to access that other world. So that's the basic pattern that I'm, that I'm finding and that I'm writing up.